Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into American political origins and evolving institutions. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this continuing conversation. Here he is now, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Today is the second day of August in the year 2017. It is a Wednesday. It is our first live broadcast this week and our final one, unfortunately, because, as you know, we we are scheduled to do our programs Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. Um, I think this week we can divvy up the responsibility for missing programs. Mondays... uh, the fault was mine. And and yesterday, our, our producers, uh, uh, Bob and Agnes both, had responsibilities out of town that they could not avoid and they could not get back in time to produce the program. So they kind of took uh, responsibility for the fact that we weren't able to do a program yesterday. But I take full responsibility for Monday. I had an eye appointment Monday morning, and they dilated my pupils, and it never even dawned on me. When I had this appointment, that it would it would create a problem doing the program. But the fact of the matter is, when I get back to the house, I couldn't see. I had to wait, you know, quite a while in the doctor's office so before I could see well enough to even get home. And then when I got home, I couldn't see to read. And the program time to to get on the air came and was coming, and 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 I said, my God, what am I going to do? Everything that I'm planning is based on a document of some sort. I've got to be able to read. So finally I contacted uh, Bob and Annette and told them I just couldn't go, that, uh, uh, that, that, I, that I'd be babbling because I couldn't see anything. And I felt terrible, and th- they were very, very understanding. But uh, it caught me by total surprise. I never even thought of that creating a problem. The appointment was earlier in the morning. I figured it, I'd be back uh, preparing the program two hours before we went on the air, I thought everything was fine. But the fact of the matter is that I wasn't able to see well for three and a half to four hours. So um, my eyes are, you know, for, for, uh, I don't know that I've ever talked about this before, but my eyes have always been very, I've been wearing glasses since I was in kindergarten. So my eyes have been very, very weak my entire life. I mean, I can remember that, uh, my my optometrist, my eye doctor, when I was growing up a kid, when my mom used to take me to the eye doctors when I first was fitted for glasses, they wanted to do what was what was then a very experimental surgery on my eyes, because the uh, the doctor told told us that uh, that if I didn't do it, I probably wouldn't be able to would be blind by the time I was in in my twenties, and. Uh, but then on the other hand, they laid this on my mom. On the other hand, they told her that if the surgery didn't work, then the, it, it itself would pretty much result in blindness. So I was, from my mom's point of view, I remember my mom and dad struggling with this decision. It was kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And they really obviously didn't know what to do. And finally, we went and saw a couple of other experts for concurring opinions and the the general opinions around Boston at the time were the surgery is still experimental don't do it so I didn't and uh, here I am unfortunately you know fortunately and I still have my sight Um, my glasses are still heavy and it's not great but given the amount of reading I do and the amount of writing I do um, I feel very very blessed uh, that I've been able to maintain my eyes through throughout my entire professional career. So I feel very, very fortunate on that. But anyway, when I do something like dilate my pupils or something, it's pretty, it's pretty serious stuff for me, I guess. But anyway, uh, welcome to a live broadcast of today's Center on the uh, Virtual Center program. And um, before I get into phone numbers and various things like that, uh, there are a couple of announcements that I want to make, which, which I think are very, very serious. Obviously, today is our final day of broadcasting this week. And for those of you who regularly listen to Bob's program and are regular followers of Head On, you probably know that Bob and Agnes are anticipating a vacation. Um, I don't uh, know all that much about it, but um, what I do know 
is that in the many years they've been together, they've never taken one. And they are going on one now. And so the fact of the matter is they will be out of town next week, and therefore there will be nobody to produce this program. So like Bob's program, uh, we'll be reliant on previous archived programs next week. So that means that after today, our next possibility of getting together again live will be a week from this coming Monday. And uh, Bob and I chatted before we came on the air today, and I told them that when they, when they get back uh, and we get into August, we'll get back on a, on a very regular schedule. And I, I commit to you that we will do that. I, I think for a number of reasons this summer – and it really hasn't been vacation. I went away for a week to New England and visited family, and now Bob's going, and it's that kind of time of year, and everybody's taking vacations. Um, and I, I don't see a reason why Bob, and especially Bob and Agnes, don't, don't deserve one, uh, especially since they, they've never had one. So I feel very, very good about that. I think all of us uh, hope that they have an absolutely great time. Uh, but let me get back to our program and, and, and thank you once again for your continued support of this program and of, of the Head On Radio Network. And, and I know that uh, it's your support that makes it possible. If, if you hadn't been as, as loyal fans as you have, then Bob and Agnes wouldn't be thinking about vacation because they wouldn't have a vacation from anything. So, so in a sense, I think – uh, all of you have a vested interest or a stake uh, in the vacation time that they have uh, duly earned. Um, I would love to hear from you. Some of you, there may be some of you out there that would just be, like to chat since we've had kind of a rocky schedule of live broadcasts of late. Um, we do have a phone number, and Bob's in the studio now. I believe Agnes is there as well. Uh, and it, uh, it'll get you on the air. The number is area code 304 Six six three four six seven six. That's three zero four six six three Horn H O R N four six seven three. If you'd like to drop me an email and share your thoughts on a particular issue or item that you'd like to get on the air, but you're a little bit reluctant to do it yourself, I'd be glad to substitute for you and do the very best I can to represent you and represent your point of view. If you drop your thoughts to me in an email, I would be more than happy to share your thoughts. I won't mention your name unless you give me permission to. And, all you, and if you even don't want to give me a name, just, just say Jack or Joe or John or Jane or whatever, whatever you want, because I won't know who you are anyway. Um, but the most important thing is what you have to say. And I would be more than happy because I know it will be worthwhile. I would be more than happy to substitute for you and get your thoughts and your ideas on the air. And as far as our Facebook page goes, uh, I call your attention to it. There are a number of things that we put on it. I put a link on the other day. That's one of the one of the items I want to get to today because it deals with health care. Um, and, and I, I want to uh, make reference to the Facebook posting that I put on there a few days ago. Uh, on this particular issue, it recommends an article that that I think all of you will find very, very helpful and very, very informative. If you are a regular user of Facebook, you you know basically how to access the page. Uh, just go to home uh, to facebook dot com for the home page, and at the top there's a search box. And if you type in the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution, you will be into our Facebook page. And you'll be able to see this posting and, and those that were put on previously. And there's an opportunity there for you to co- for you to comment. Or you can always drop me an email, waobrian906 at gmail.com. Or uh, you can, you know, hold. And when we come back on the air a week from Monday, um, I would love to hear from you. So, um there, there's a lot, an awful lot of opportunity for you to interact, and that's really kind of what this program aims to be about, is to get out the kind of information and the kind of substance of information and, and opinion that solicits input, response, and discussion. 
and that's really what it's about, and I, uh, uh, I invite you to take advantage of it. I think in this day and age, it's very, very important that we take advantage. Uh, there's no question. I think all of us are appreciative of the extent to which Donald Trump takes advantage of, of whatever access and whatever communication vehicles he can lay his hands on. I think it's very necessary and important that the rest of us do, do the same. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to get into a few things. It's been a, a while since we've been together, perhaps about a week, I think. And um, an awful lot's happened since then. Uh, the mooch has come and gone. Um, he came just as we were on the air for the first time. And by the time I get on the air again, he's gone. So it, it's interesting because in our political system, things don't usually happen that fast. Um, I think if you watch the Republicans uh, struggle with health care over the last several weeks and months, uh, you know how difficult it is to get action on, on just about anything in this country and uh, in this political system. So uh, this particular one happened quickly, and I think all of you are in – again, it's been so heavily covered – by the media, that I think everybody's very familiar with what happened and, and what it's about. I know that there's a lot of people that saw hypocrisy galore uh, in the president's explanation that this guy had to go because of the vulgarity of some of the language he used in his New Yorker interview. Uh, not interview, but, but email. But the fact of the matter is, um, hypocrisy or not, it was pretty. It was pretty disgusting, and um, I think a lot of people are holding out hope about John Kelly. Um, it just happens that over the last couple of, you know, Monday and now uh, and Tuesday, over the first two days this week, that John Kelly has been um, special counsel to the president. Um, the uh, the uh, chief of staff. Um, the president has let up on the tweets, and some people are holding out hope that maybe there's really going to be a change. Uh, I think I think all of us are uh, are delusionary if we think that. Um, I also think, and I mentioned this the last time we were together. I also think that it's delusion for us to think that this Republican majority in Congress is going to do anything about the president's behavior until they absolutely are forced to. Uh, it's very obvious that they are getting more out of this president in terms of political cover than, so, than it's costing them, as much as it is costing them. There's some indication right now that there's some blowback happening among various and, and prominent Republicans. I think that the health care situation probably created a lot of that. But the fact of the matter is there are signs that a number of prominent Republicans are, are willing, have shown some willingness to take on the Trump administration, take on the White House. But I also think, recognize that there are many people that think that the president is involved in some situations which which many people in the media believe might be uh, grounds for an impeachment trial. Um, other people aren't. But the fact of the matter is, recognizing that you've got Republican majorities in both houses, I think that we're dreaming if we think that this group is, is going to do anything. This guy is... is uh, immune at this point. He can do what he wants and he's doing it, I think. And I think many of us hold out this hope that our political system, our constitutional system can withstand this, can withstand anything. I can remember in the 70s when I was teaching during the, the Watergate situation when, uh, in the early 70s when President Nixon was forced to resign. I can remember talk, mentioning to students 
about the strength of our political system. The vice president was indicted and convicted of a felony, of a crime. Other people in the administration were going to jail and were being thrown out of office. Attorneys general were being fired because they wouldn't fire a special prosecutor. And yet the country went on. People continued to go to work each day. And at the time, I felt that it spoke to the strength and stability of our political system. But as I watch what's happening now, I don't really believe that our political system is capable of handling this, especially when government is under control of the party to which the president claims an affiliation. It's his party in power. He has the pen and he has acknowledged that he's ready to sign whatever comes his way. And so, in a sense, the Republican majority in both houses, majorities in both houses, are in a position where if they can get their act together in terms of fashioning policy into legislation, they can get it through and get it signed by the president. But so far, they've been unable to do that. But they continue to try. I think there's no question that their biggest goal is tax reform. Or at least one of their biggest goals is tax reform. And they aren't going to jeopardize that by doing anything about containing or controlling this president and create a situation where he begins to, to, to push back against them. So, you know, that's just, that's just my feeling. Several days ago, um, I received a post, a, a, a message uh, and a posting from my sister-in-law. And in it, this was a reaction. It was four or five days after the president's appearance here in West Virginia a week ago Monday at the Boy Scout Jamboree here in southern West Virginia. And we talked about that the last time we were on the air. I think that was the Wednesday after that, about what I believe was the extremely inappropriate comments of the President of the United States before the Boy Scouts. And we talked about the specifics of that. I won't go into all the details. But he turned it into a political rally, a rally for himself, and thereby passed and on an opportunity to deliver a message straight from the President of the United States to thousands of Boy Scouts assembled. That is an opportunity that I don't think any administration can afford to squander, especially in today's world, given some of the positive, many positives and some of the very serious negatives about the Boy Scouts, and we kind of know what they are. So I think under the present circumstances, there were all sorts of opportunities, all sorts of possibilities here for good things to happen. And it didn't. None of them happened. In fact, I believe what happened was very, very inappropriate, was very, very negative. My sister-in-law sent me this posting, which was a piece written by a college undergraduate who's attending school in Pennsylvania. It appeared online in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in a digital publication called Lancaster Online. And it was posted by an author, by, by a columnist, a journalist named Benjamin Ponce. And in this piece, he presents an Eagle Scout's re, uh, reactions to President Trump's jamboree, jamboree speech, along with a prospective alternative speech that he could have given. I shared that on my Facebook page five or six days ago. <coughs> 
I continue to get reactions to it. Not only did I have an incredible number of likes, but the number of people who commented on this um, is incredible. I uh, Probably two dozen, maybe. Um, basically, then, this young man, and I want to give him credit, his name is Benjamin Ponce. He's an Eagle Scout in Strasbourg, a sophomore in political science and public policy at Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania. And he proposes this as an alternative message, one that could have been given by the president to a group that aims to embody so much of what we report to value as a country. I'd like to share this with you if you haven't seen it or heard from it, because I think it's that powerful, that positive, and that good. On a foggy evening in London more than a hundred years ago, Ponce says, a disoriented businessman named William Boyce received directions from a young man who expected nothing in return. He was a scout doing a good turn. Inspired by the simple act of kindness, Boyce brought an organization to America that has been part of America's fabric for 107 years. In a time when our politics divides us, the scout law reminds us of our duty to ourselves, to one another, and to our country. It extols the virtues of citizenship. It centers our mind on service. And it reminds us of our fundamental duty to love our neighbors as ourselves. In this day and age, with the kinds of negative political actions and reactions and comments that swirl around us, it seems to me, that paragraph speaks loud and clear to where we've come from and where we need to go back to. Scout law reminds us of our duty to ourselves, to one another, and to our country. It extols the virtues of citizenship. It centers our mind on service. And it reminds us of our fundamental duty to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are talking here about the oath of the Boy Scouts. Keep in mind, we're not talking about the, the divergent or deviant behavior of individuals who have acted in inappropriate ways and brought negative publicity to the Boy Scouts. The fact of the matter is what the Boy Scouts stand for has not, has not changed. We find wisdom, Ponce says, in the points of the scout law. A scout is trust trustworthy. He can trust his neighbor. His neighbor can trust him. A scout is loyal, not to any one political party or ideology, but to his peers and to his country. A scout is helpful. He knows that when one of us succeeds, we all succeed. To that end, when he has come, when he has a hand to lend, he lends it, trusting that the next time he needs a hand, someone will lend him one. I'm thinking back to the book that all of us saw so many years ago, Everything Worthwhile I Learned in Kindergarten. That's what this is about. It's been a long time since we've heard it or seen it. It's beyond time that we rectify that. A scout is friendly, courteous, and kind. He doesn't need a reason to show kindness to someone else. And he doesn't expect a quid pro quo. He just does what is right. 
a scout is obedient. Whether or not he agrees with his directive, he upholds it. And then later, if he believes it's unwise, he seeks to change it through proper channels. He respects leaders and authorities, realizing that they must make decisions and he must respect them. A scout is cheerful. He maintains a positive attitude when even circumstances appear bleak. When the challenges appear insurmountable, he puts a smile on his face and presses forward because he realizes the only permanent failure is a failure to put forth one's best effort. A scout is thrifty. He uses his time, his energy, and his money wisely. A scout is brave. He stands what up for what he believes is right, even if that means he stands alone. Faced with a moral dilemma, he turns inward to confirm what he knows is right, rather than looking outward to see what the crowd is doing. If I can pause for a moment and make a comment there, I couldn't read that short paragraph without thinking about James Madison. And the quotation from the Federalist Papers that we have cited, I think it's Federalist 55, if I'm not mistaken, from, from Madison. When Madison is talking about factions and talking about the power and the influence of the crowd and Madison's realization and recognition that within all of us, there is a moral sense, a conscience, an inherent, innate awareness of what's right and what's wrong. In the privacy of our own chamber, Madison says, this moral sense has a chance to be dominant. It has a very good chance of controlling what we do and how we do it. It gives us the strength to resist the, the pressures of the mob, the pressures of others. But when we get in groups, or Madison, in Madison's case, factions, that moral sense is inclined to be repressed. What Madison believed is that we have to work very, very hard to so encourage, so strengthen that moral sense that it can withstand the pressures of the crowd. Jefferson made that same comment, made the same, delivered the same message to his nephew, Peter Carr, in his, 18, in his 1787 letter when he told Peter Carr the moral sense or conscience within all of us is like any other limb of the body. It can be strengthened with exercise. And Jefferson recommended that his nephew read good books because good books strengthen and tend to strengthen this moral sense within all of us so that we aren't so easily susceptible to the pressures of groupthink. And here are the Boy Scouts saying basically the same thing. A scout stands up for what he believes is right even if that means he stands alone. Faced with a moral dilemma, he turns inward to confirm what he knows is right, rather than looking outward to see what the crowd is doing. That's powerful, it seems to me. I think back to Madison's faith in our democratic electoral system, in our popular government election system. And Madison's belief that this kind of moral rectitude 
is what we need to look to from our elected representatives. And our best chance of finding it is to trust in the wisdom of the people to look for those very qualities in who we in whom we elect, whom we vote for. And now I think back to the recent debacle on health care. The Republican skinny bill that McConnell and a few others put together over lunch a bill that senators were given two hours to look to before they started to vote on it at midnight. And the Republican senator who took the floor for the first hour of those two and prevented anybody from raising serious questions about this pretended legislation. Actually, it's not pretended legislation. It was really proposed legislation that was, that was a sham. And the number of Republicans, and this is my point, the number of Republican senator, senators who expressed a willingness to vote for this disaster if they could be assured by the House that it would never become law, that what they voted for would be blocked by the House and that the House of Representatives would never vote for it. In other words, these people were willing to vote for something they knew was wrong and bad for the people of this country if they could get assurance from House members that the House would protect them and keep this from becoming law. What have we come to? What do we need to think about as we gear up for another election cycle in 2018? And then this uh, alternative speech goes on. A scout is clean in thought, word, and deed. A scout is reverent. He puts God ahead of everyone and everything else. Trust in divine wisdom, etc. In this age of division and incivility, Ponce says, I call upon all Americans to reflect on the values of the scout law. When we're willing to work as a team, caring more about the job getting done than who gets the credit, we can overcome so many of the self-imposed barriers before us. And then he goes on with a couple of concluding paragraphs. I have to tell you that I've been very, very encouraged by the number of very positive comments I've received from people who didn't, weren't aware of this particular posting. It's been months since we've seen or heard anything quite like that. There was a time in America when we used to hear about that all the time. In fact, I think that has backfired. And it's not anything that I had planned, but I'm there. So let me let me make let me just sh- take a moment and share with you. Uh, a couple of general comments about about that particular aspect. Since the last time we were on the air, this past weekend, I I received a call about five or six weeks weeks ago from a gentleman who was arranging the 60th anniversary of a high school graduating class here in southern West Virginia, a high school that no longer even exists. And he asked me if I would speak at this, their 60th anniversary. And I told him I would be glad to. 
In fact, I told him, you know, kind of jokingly that my 60th high school reunion would not be until next year. So I really look forward to speaking to a group of people that was older than I am by a year. But anyway, um, when I asked him what he wanted me to speak about, he said, we think that it would be kind of nice if you could bring some historical perspective on some of the major changes that have occurred between 1957 when we graduated from high school and now. And I thought, oh, that's that's a pretty broad range of options and possibilities, isn't it? But I told him I would be glad to. So this Saturday night, this past Saturday evening, I delivered that address. And I basically looked upon, because this group obviously graduated 1957. The values and priorities of this group reflected very, very clearly the priorities, attitudes, and characteristics of the 1950s in America. This was the period of I Love Lucy, the period of Leave it to Beaver, the period of moral messages. In education during this period, there used to be a course that was required of all high school students and many college students, for lack of a better term, on what was called civics. It was a mandatory course in American government. The purpose of it was to deliver the message to young people that this young Eagle Scout delivered in, an, in the alternative speech that he said might have been delivered by the president to the Boy Scout Jamboree this year, but wasn't. At the time, I can remember as an educator thinking, well, as a prospective educator, I was still in high school, obviously, but I can remember thinking about the negatives of civics. Because everything I could pick up on, not, uh, up on, not only in my own experience, but in talking to other people, was that from many perspectives, the civics course that many of these people were required to take turned out to be kind of what students used to call a joke. It was a basic government class. But more important than that, it was a course that was supposed to be filled with all the values and moral lessons that, that have as their origin the cherry tree story with George Washington, I cannot tell a lie. Most students looked upon the syllabus, looked upon the objectives, the learning objectives of this course as kind of a joke. It's no joke now because the reality is there was some basic understanding about how the American political system was designed to work in those classes. And those classes became so negative that school after school began to drop the requirement and now nobody takes civics anymore. And what we're seeing is the result of that. That people who come along and tell people what they call alternative truths and get so many people to believe it is because they don't have any grounding in anything else. Basically, we are leaving our young people vulnerable to what those with their own agenda, would tell them and ask them to believe. The result is that many of our people are confused. They really aren't sure. They don't know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And they're much more vulnerable than they ought to be to the most persuasive argument or in some cases, the most recent argument. 
it's ironic that that's one of the accusations made against President Trump, that the people that have the most influence on him are the people that get to speak to him last. Because as far as a grounding in values and morals, there's very little to indicate that there is any of such grounding. What I talked to this group about on Saturday evening was leave it to Beaver. I reminded them that the episodes are still being shown on television. They are on MeTV and occasionally on Hallmark, as I recall, or have been on Hallmark. Hallmark, as you know, runs older television shows. One of my favorites is Jessica Fletcher. Given today's world and today's movies and and the realities of digital uh, capability to portray realism, when you watch Jessica and Matlock, even the murders are almost humane, if that makes sense. But the group I talked to on Saturday evening remembered Leave it to Beaver very well because they grew up with it. It was one of the featured shows on nightly television. Everybody watched it. Everybody knew all the characters. Everybody knew the personalities of all the characters. The message of the 1950s was one of optimism and stability and hope. In watching some of these sitcoms, some of these television shows, one never got a sense that there were any problems in American society. There were no racial issues. There were no civil rights questions. There were no serious issues of crime or drugs or alcoholism or spouse abuse or child abuse or any of these other things that we hear about all the time today. No, Leave it to Beaver would open with two boys coming from school and opening the gate of the white picket fence in front of this suburban home through a neatly manicured front yard and up to a very, very tactfully uh, decorated front porch. And once you opened the door and went inside, there was always... June Cleaver, Mrs. Cleaver, to greet you. She was always there. She was a stay-at-home mom. In the 50s, there was no nothing else. There were no other such things. No alternatives but to be a stay-at-home mom. She was always there when the children came in from school. But she wasn't just there. She was always dressed in high heels. She always had her makeup on. Earrings. And necklace on. Dressed to the nines. Ready to go out to dinner at the drop of a hat. Always ready to go. Ward... He worked, but he didn't really work, not like so many of us are used to working and remember our dads and granddads working. Ward was in the library. He maneuvered around the house in a jacket and tie all the time. And he was full of the moral lessons that were involved in raising children in the 1950s. And the piece of clay, the piece of human clay 
that the series was about molding was Beaver. Every episode, it seemed, found Beaver caught up in some dilemma, some moral crisis that would be resolved within the 30 minutes allotted for the program. But Beaver wasn't required to go through this life by himself. He had an older brother, Wally. Wally was perfect. He was the perfect model for what you wanted a young son to be. He was bright. He was handsome. He was physically attractive. He was athletically inclined. He lettered in high school athletics. He never had any trouble getting dates. He was always going to dances. Always asking different girls out. They never declined. And he was what we would call a darn good kid. A perfect model for Beaver. But Wally had a friend. Eddie Haskell. Eddie Haskell was everything that Wally wasn't. Eddie Haskell was manipulative. Eddie Haskell was selfish. Every Eddie Haskell was condescending. He was inclined to be artificially nice to everybody. The episodes that contained it always got a laugh. When Eddie Haskell would come in to the Cleaver home, and the first thing he would do would be to compliment Mrs. Cleaver on her dress or on her hair or on her makeup or something. That is a gorgeous outfit, Mrs. Cleaver. And she would respond in kind, Oh, thank you so much, Eddie. And then she would look at Ward, and the eyes would tell you that she knew he wasn't saying one thing he really meant. When Eddie Haskell got in trouble, it was usually serious trouble. But again, all of this is a matter of perspective. What was serious trouble in the 1950s is nothing in today's world of serious trouble. But that's another story. The danger always would be that Beaver would take his cues and learn from Eddie Haskell rather than Wally. And the principal solution to make sure that didn't happen was Ward. In most episodes, Ward would take Beaver into the study. And on this program, the implication was that everybody had a library and a study. When in fact, we know that everybody did not and still does not. But that was the place of privacy where the moral lessons were delivered. That's where the cherry cherry tree story unfolded each week. That's when Ward was able to put Beaver back on track and solve the problems which comprised 95% of that evening's program. If you think about it, Leave it to Beaver was a perfect reflection of the priorities and the values of the 1950s. It was soapy. 
it was a little bit embarrassing and uncomfortable to many people. But at the same time, it's what many people believed. It's what the Boy Scouts oath is all about. It's about putting your neighbor first. It's about doing things for other people and not expecting anything in return. It's about your faith in community. Your faith that other people are learning the same lessons you are. And if it ever happens that you're in trouble, somebody will be there to help you. And therefore, you don't mind doing what you can for people because you know that if the situation was turned around, they would be there doing it for you. That's what genuine community and affection is about. That's what America was about. That's what the message of what America was supposed to be was about. And now we're looking at a nation that is six months into the throes of an administration that seems to be con consciously trashing that entire value system and effectively telling us that, that those messages, that message is a message for suckers. It's an invitation to be taken advantage of and be had. It's why America has been losing and losing and losing all over the world in its negotiations with other people. It's why America has had such terrible trade deals. It's why other nations have been consistently able to take advantage of us. In other words, it is a message that appeals to those people for whom the values of the 1950s never were or never materialized. It is a message to those for whom nothing in their lives has happened that would give that, those values and that message any credibility of being real. It's people that have come, it's for people who have come to believe that that may be a great message for the people that are doing well. But for those who are hurting, it's meaningless, it's a joke, we don't want to hear it, we don't want to see it, we don't want anything from anybody that has bought into it, we're looking for some other message. And that other message came along in the person of the man who now is in the White House. He was able to tap into this hostility, anger, and frustration and say all the things that they always wanted to say but could never find anybody to listen. And therefore, whatever he does, whatever people say about him that's negative, whatever the media accuses him of, they can rationalize and justify. It doesn't matter. He doesn't have class. It doesn't matter. He pushes back harder than people push him. It's about time somebody did that. It's about time the nation did that. The message is that America had the potential to be great and for a while was great, but it allowed itself to slip into this idea that we could refashion, remodel, and change the world. That we could make the realities and the message of the 1950s, the message of the United States of America, that was picked up and bought into by all the other peoples of the world. 
the criticism that we hear now is that America was trying to do what the 1950s were about and expecting other people to respect it and appreciate it. And instead, they took advantage of us. And they took advantage of it. And our people are getting murdered as a result. We can't find jobs. We can't find respect. We can't raise our families. We can't hold our families together. We can't do anything. Uh, We can't get any meaningful way to do anything except become addicted. We're in a spiral that continues to go down, down, down. And there never seemed to be any way to stop that descent until now. And that's the message. It's a frightful message. Let me say. Let's be honest. If you halfway followed the debates and the coverage of the health care issue over the last several weeks, it is not possible. to look at a piece of health care legislation and interpret it in such diametrically opposed ways as this particular bill was being interpreted. At the same time, the Democrats and opponents and health care companies and hospitals and doctors groups and all those who knew health care were saying that this bill was a disaster It would knock tens of millions of Americans out of health care. It would devastate families. It would kill people dependent on on, on expensive medication. And all the other criticisms of it. At the same time, supporters of this legislation are out there saying that it finally gets government out of health care. It finally trusts in the magic of the market to deliver health care, keep prices down. It is, says the president, the health care that he promised in a campaign, better health care for more people at less cost. None of the evidence proves that. None of the evidence even hints at that. And yet they continue to say it. The question I ask is why or how would or could they continue to say it unless they knew that there were people out there who believed what they were saying, even though the evidence speaks otherwise, even though the reality of the evidence says something dramatically different. It's a different way of looking at it. It's alternative facts. And people believe that. The only explanation is, the only reason people believe it is because they want to believe it. And they don't want to take seriously evidence to the contrary. This is the opportunity that these people have been waiting for. They will not squander it. They will not turn on this president. They trust him. Realistically, we know they lie. But these people are willing to believe that if they are lying, they are lying for a better purpose. And that better purpose benefits them, finally. So here we are.
the realities of America in late summer of 2017. I really think this is extremely important stuff for all of us to dwell on and pay attention to. I hope that you will. We have reached the top of the hour. We've just gone a little bit beyond the top of the hour. You're listening to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, as we usually do on our Monday and Wednesday broadcasts. We will pause and take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll do our second hour here on the Virtual Center. I know that Bob or Agnes, whoever happens to be producing the program today in the studios, will have some music that we'll play for four or five minutes until we come back together again. But again, we'll be gone only a short time. I ask you to stay with us. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Well, we have both Bob and Agnes today, and that's just great. Welcome to our second hour here at the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Uh, if you've been here with us through our first hour, I want to thank you for staying with us. If you are just joining us, I want to welcome you. And I also want to let you know, re- remind you, uh, for those who heard it before, but let you know, for those who did not hear the beginning of our program today, that um, our folks at Head On are going to be taking a little bit of vacation next week. And so we're not going to be producing, able to produce this program. Uh, we'll have uh, archive programs on, I suspect. Uh, and I just want you to know that. So after our program today, when we get through this hour in today's program, we won't be back together again live until a week from Monday. But Bob and I both chatted today, and we kind of agreed that when their vacation's over and and when we get get our feet back on the ground and get ready to go, we're going to go full blast uh, beginning week after next. So uh, I ask that you share this with your friends who are also listeners of our program and ask them to be patient and hang in there with us and hopefully maybe even enjoy some of the previous programs that are available on on archi- in archived form. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll be back and... Um, Thank you. Thank you for your continued support of the network and for, for your continued support of, of this program. We spent our first hour, if you are just w- with us, on an alternative message from an Eagle Scout who was very critical of President Trump's speech to the Boy Scouts a week ago Monday night and presented an alternative. And uh, we shared much, much of that alternative in our first hour. And got into a little bit of discussion about the contrast between the message of this Eagle Scout and the realities of our political world today. The realities that that delivered to us um, the president of the United States that that is really the issue that seems to be driving so much of what our programs continue to focus on of of late. I would love to hear from you. I know that our other listeners would as well. We do have a phone number, and it's there just for this purpose. And as you just heard, Agnes is in the studio. And if you do call, she'll get you on the air immediately. Our phone number is area code 304-663-4676. 304-663-4676. If you'd like to communicate directly with me one-on-one in an email, I would love to hear from you. You can do it that way. I know that uh, it's becoming very real, even to me, obvious, even to me, and I'm not what you would call a techie at all. Uh, that email is becoming a little bit less uh, prominent in our social communication than it has been previously. But I do have an email address, and I would love to hear from you. I check it every day. Um, my email address is waobrian906 at gmail.com. Waobrian, O B R I E N, 906 at gmail.com. And then I ask you to take a look at our Facebook page. Just go to the homepage for Facebook, facebook.com, 
and in the search box type in the virtual center for the study of the constitution and you will be into our facebook page and you will see the most recent postings there in fact the issue that i'd like to get into in the second hour today I believe is the last posting on our Facebook page. I believe it is. It could be that I put another one on since then, but I'm not I'm not really sure. And I when I put this on Facebook, I opened with an apology. Because I know most people like myself believed that the healthcare issue at least for a time was on the back burner and off the front page. And it seemed a little bit, I was a little bit uncomfortable putting the link on the Facebook page to an article, yet another article, about health care. But the most fascinating thing about the health care issue, like so many other issues in our, uh, in our discussions, is that every time you think you're done, you're really not. There's always something more to be learned or to be considered. I ran across a review, a book review, of two books on health care in the New York Review of Books, the publication in early June. So I've had this, uh, I've had these for a, for a while. This one is in a little bit more recent New York Review of Books than that. Let me be a little bit more specific. This was published in mid-July. The July 13th issue of the New York Review of Books. The title of the reviews, the title of the article, is Putting Profits Ahead of Patients. It is a review of two books on American health care. The first one, the one that I posted about, it's the one that I focused on most in my comments on Facebook, is entitled An American Sickness, How Health Care Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back. The author, Elizabeth Rosenthal, is a doctor, a physician, turned journalist. She wrote this book on the American healthcare system from the inside as a physician. The second book under review here is a book called Getting Risk Right, Understanding the Science of Elusive Health Risks. The author is Jeffrey Kabat. It's the first one that I wanted to stress to my friends on Facebook. It deals principally with a history of healthcare in America that I think, and I said on Facebook, I find astounding. I'm a historian. If I knew about the origins of Blue Cross and Blue Shield in America, I really forgot it. I found what she was saying fascinating. And that's why I put the link on Facebook and I urged those who who consult our Facebook page to go to this link and read this review from the New York Review of Books. I don't believe that I knew that the transition from health care that focused on the patient to a system that focused on profit was really part of health care's history in America. This book covers a key part of that story. And that's the part of the story that I'd like to share with you today. The story begins in Dallas, Texas, at Baylor University Medical Center. This is a quote 
from the New York Review of Books. It began when the hospital accumulated large numbers of unpaid bills for its services and decided to offer the local teachers union a deal. This was in the 20s. For $6 a year, members who subscribed were entitled to a 21-day stay in the hospital, all expenses paid. There was a deductible. The insurance would take effect only after a week of hospital costs that averaged $5 per day. So if you signed up for this Baylor Medical Center insurance program at a cost of $6 per year, you would be entitled to have all of your bills paid for however long you were in the hospital, provided you, were, you could wait for the deductible, which is that you were in the hospital for a week on, the, on your own costs. And then at the end of that, the plan would kick in. Baylor's plan became Blue Cross. And it spread across the country in the early 20th century. The goal was not profit. It was to keep citizens from going bankrupt. And at the same time, shoring up hospitals and clinics that delivered care to those citizens. The plan was so successful that it created for-profit competitors who saw the potential of health care. The first two major players as for-profit industries of for-profit entities in this industry were Aetna and Cigna. We know both of those. The difference between them and Blue Cross, however, was that they, in their plans, only accepted healthy people. Blue Cross and later Blue Shield, and they merged, took everyone whether you were sick or not. Naturally, the profit-driven plans could underprice Blue Cross Blue Shield because Blue Cross Blue Shield didn't select the people they covered. They covered everybody. The for-profits only covered healthy people. People that didn't use or need health care. The result was that the companies were making money and the insurance payouts were very small. As a result, the premiums remained very low. And the fact of the matter is, you could buy their insurance a lot cheaper than Blue Cross Blue Shield because Blue Cross Blue Shield had to charge premiums that covered the costs of what they were paying out. Aetna and Cigna weren't paying out anything. In 1994, Blue Cross and Blue Shield finally realized that they had to do something because they were losing money. They were going under. And in 1994, they became for-profit as well. Dr. Rosenthal, the author of the book, says, this was the final nail in the coffin of old-fashioned, noble-minded health care in America, unquote. In California, the Blues, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they refer to themselves as the Blues, changed their name to WellPoint. WellPoint's first priority appeared no longer to be its patient, its members, or even the companies and the unions that, it, that used it as an insurer, but instead 
its slave, its shareholders and investors. The change to WellPoint meant that the priorities of investors and shareholders became more important than the priorities of patients. WellPoint continued to cast themselves as caregivers. Rosenthal points out that that's not what they are at all. They are investment opportunities for investors. It's their welfare, not the welfare of patients. That's their, that is their first priority. That's what for-profit is about. Doing the bidding of shareholders. Making sure that the value of the stock is going up. And that shareholders are getting solid returns on their investments. That's the priority that drives company policy, not the needs of patients. The reason I say this is because it's very important to think about this in light of the debates we've been hearing about health care. The conversation is always about patients, about covering patients, even sick patients with pre-existing conditions. But the reality is that these architects of an alternative to Obamacare are principally interested in for-profit solutions to the health care crisis. That means that the priorities of shareholders must always come first. That means that insurance companies somehow have to be insuring healthy people, young people. The only way to do that is to get old people and sick people out of the system. Find some way to address their health care which doesn't result in driving the premiums up, the deductibles, the co-pays, all of that. The only way to do that is to come up with a separate fund or a separate system for the very sick. Let the states run it because each state, the argument goes, faces different, a different set of problems. One solution in healthcare doesn't fit all. We've got to create local control and local flexibility, they say. That means turning it over to states, the bulk of which Republican legislatures and governors control. And what the federal government would do would be to send subsidies to the states. And it would be up to the states to make the key decisions on the distribution of health care services to people that needed and use health care. <coughs> That would mean that the health care system as such would offer lower premiums to working people because the sickest users of health care would be out of the equation, would be off the table, so to speak. And that means that you could go back to the kind of system that Aetna and Blue Cross, Aetna and Cigna had 
while Blue Cross was taking all the sick people. So in a sense, what these people looking for an alternative to Obamacare, to the Affordable Health Plan, have done is separate the citizenry into those people who are like most likely to use health care because they need it and those people who aren't. And to craft the program along, along for profit lines in the interests of the healthy. That means that you are providing affordable health care to people who are working, need it, and earn it. And no longer is health care likely to remain something that bankrupts a family or causes them to lose their home, their savings, retirement, everything. This is what they're selling. And they're selling it to people who need health care. Many of them who only have health care because of the Affordable Care Act. Because of the expansion of Medicaid. This plan would take almost $8 billion. Excuse me, eight. $800 Hundred billion dollars, not eight billion, eight hundred billion, almost a trillion dollars out of Medicare, a uh, Medicaid. You can't take that much money out of Medicaid and continue to provide for the health services of the people who would be on it. They won't be able to afford anything. They won't be able to afford it. They're the people who need it most. They're the people whose services will cost the most. And they're out of the system. And in their weak moments, when they don't think that anybody's listening to them, they will admit that it's the people who are working who have earned the right to affordable quality health care. Not the takers. The takers will take what we can afford to give them. And that ain't much. If you're taking almost a trillion dollars off the table. But. By taking that $800 billion off the table and out of Medicaid. What you are doing is creating an opening, greasing the skids, making it possible to craft legislation on a tax cut that would remain budget neutral. The limitation on all of this is that in order to enact a tax cut that is meaningful it's got to be budget neutral it can't be anything that is detrimental to the budget so what they have to do is do health care first they got to get health care legislation through in order to get the cuts in Medicaid through So they can create the opening for tax cuts. There's a posting. Making it around Facebook over the last couple of days. The CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield, which of course is now now for profit. has announced that Blue Cross Blue Shield premiums rates 
will be up 24% next year, which means that most people won't be able to afford it. That's the reality. The difference is, unlike other companies that are pulling out of the Affordable Care Act out of the exchanges, the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield explained why the company needed the 24% rate increase in premiums. The answer, the Trump administration. The president is threatening, the administration is threatening to suspend the subsidies that are being paid to insurance companies to subsidize the care of the poor and elderly under the Affordable Care Act. The only way that insurance companies could afford to cover pre-existing conditions would be, was, if government subsidized the companies for the costs of covering sick people. In 2014, Marco Rubio spotted these payments to insurance companies, labeled them as bailouts to insurance companies, and put the Republican Party in the Senate on record as stopping government bailouts to insurance companies for health care, thus saving the nation, he felt, $400 billion in subsidies. The fact of the matter is these subsidies were the only way, the only thing that made the Affordable Care Act even possible. Without those subsidies... Insurance companies can't afford to cover old people and sick people in any way except that people pay for their own coverage. And the companies are raising the rates appropriately to meet that threat. Because after all, as for-profit companies, the shareholders have to make money. They can't lose. They have to win. They have to win before anybody else can win. What Dr. Rosenthal has done in this book is give us a history lesson in healthcare in America that explains clearly the difference between government support for health care and health care based exclusively on for profit companies. I think it's an incredible story. It doesn't stop there. Rosenthal also does a tremendous amount with hospitals. For, with specifically with those hospitals who call themselves not-for-profit. I serve on the board of one. I'm totally committed to this hospital. But the fact of the matter is, because it's not-for-profit, it's not answerable to shareholders. It's answerable to the state in the name of the people that it covers, in the name of patients. The difference between for-profit and not-for-profit hospitals is in the creation of boards of governance and shareholders. For-profit hospitals must put the priorities of shareholders and investors first. If their investment is losing money, they're going to sell their stock. They're not going to invest in a company in which they're not making money. 
Therefore, if the company is going to have working capital, it's got to find that capital. in making sure that the shareholders are making money. Not-for-profit hospitals don't have to do that. They don't have these shareholder responsibilities. Instead, they answer to state agencies and to the federal government. In, the, in our case, what is called the CMS, the Commission for Medicare. And med I, I think it's called the Commission for Medicare and Medicaid, something like that. It's a federal agency that holds hospitals accountable and sets rates for procedures. That's a major contribution, I think, of Rosenthal's book is that history. But there's one more. And it applies specifically to doctors, to physicians. Part of the shift from patient priorities to investor or shareholder priorities involves doctors. One of the things that WellPoint did when Blue Cross Blue Shield California became WellPoint is that WellPoint stopped paying salaries to its doctors. No longer were its doctors its employees. Instead, these doctors became independent contractors. They became businessmen. Each doctor's practice became a business unto itself. And by definition, businesses are in business to make money. What that meant was that instead of being hospital employees able to put the priorities of patients first, making doctors businesses put these businesses, these doctors, into the position of being entrepreneurs. They had to recruit their own business. They had to recruit their own patients. They had to do their own advertising. They had to do their own promotion. And more important, they had to make money. Because the only thing the hospital did was provide them a place to practice. So the idea is that by providing them a place to practice... WellPoint and other for-profit hospitals are giving doctors a place to conduct business. And it's up to the doctors to make sure that that business becomes profitable for them. So in a sense, these businesses are renting access to the hospitals and they're paying the hospitals for it. No longer are these doctors employees of the hospital hired to, require, to, hired to provide services to patients. Now they are independent entrepreneurs practicing their craft at a hospital, which is no different than J.C. Penney's or Sears renting store space at a mall. Consequently, doctors must look for every opportunity in the world to increase profits. That means they must over-prescribe over services, whether in fact patients need them or not. And the result is that costs skyrocket. 
there's no way to get a control to get control over the cost of health care because the costs are out of control because everybody in it is a businessman an entrepreneur in it to make money theoretically nobody's in it to serve patients serving patients is the way you make money but it's up to you to make it At the end of World War II, Ro uh, Ro Rosenthal says, many nations, when they saw the potential crisis in health care, created national health care systems to compete with for-profit providers. But the United we in the United States, of course, were caught up in the Cold War. We were the world's line in the sand, if you will against the spread of international communism. The last thing we could do or wanted to do was to create socialized medicine, to create socialism in our health care. Rather, the only way that we could combat communism and combat the theories and the ideology of communism is to promote and strengthen the for-profit free enterprise system. We had to continue in the for-profit direction that we were in in healthcare, because our ideological stand against international communism and socialism required it, which meant that we couldn't go into the in the direction that other, that many nations went, which is providing nas national healthcare systems to make sure that all citizens were served in healthcare. Instead, we had to continue on the road to make health care a commodity, a for-profit commodity in America, where every service had a value, every service had a price. And doctors were in the business of maximizing their own profits by maximizing the services delivered to students, excuse me, delivered to patients and paid for by their insurance provider. Consequently, the costs couldn't go anywhere but up. The only thing that could keep them down was to have a lot of people that didn't need or use health care. That meant that you had to insure working healthy people. And that meant that you couldn't afford to insure non-working people, old people, sick people, disabled people, the people who need it most, the for-profit system can afford to deliver services to least. And that's the system. That our congressmen and representatives are being asked to vote on. That's the history. It's sick. In fact, the title of Rosenthal's book deals with the question of sickness. The title of her book is An American Sickness. Our American system, system our American sickness is our healthcare system. How ironic, how sad, how frightening, how hopeless it seems to suggest solutions might be. I think this is the rationalization, the foundation, justification for a national system of universal health care. Government provided health care, kind of like Medicare for everybody. Yes, it's going to increase taxes. Yes, on a system 
of progressive taxation where the people who make the most and can afford to pay the most pay it. It's going to hurt the wealthy. The fact of the matter is the reason it hurts them more than everybody else is because they can best withstand it. The alternative is we don't take care of our own people. And we remain the only industrialized modern com- country in the world that doesn't look at health care for its citizens as a human right. Again, go to our Facebook page and look up the posting because the link to the article is there in the New York Review of Books. It's the July 13th edition. It's available online. You don't have to be a subscriber. If you look at the table of contents at each publication of the New York Review, about a third of the entries are available to everybody. Two-thirds of them are available only to subscribers. And the New York Review is very, very uh, – it's expensive, I believe. It's close. It approaches – $75, $80 a year for a subscription. This particular article is available to everybody. I think it's well worth reading. It may be a book you want to get your hands on. The authors of this entry, this article in the New York Review point out some negatives that Rosenthal makes, some negatives to her book. So and they, even they don't admit it's perfect. But the information in there is important. It's information that no pe- that people don't have. It's information I didn't have. I thought I knew some, most of this, much of this stuff, but I didn't know that. I I remember when everybody had Blue Cross, but I really never appreciated why that was true. We had it. I can remember we had it because my mom used it. As I mentioned at the beginning of our program in our first hour today, I w- I was having problems with my eyes right from the time I was in kindergarten and they were talking about doing serious surgery and my mom had a blue cross card blue cross blue shield that's what everybody had the for profit system changed that Aetna and Cigna saw an opportunity to move into healthcare create private companies for the investment of investors with cash to invest and make money on health care. In the process, it seemingly, according to Rosenthal, destroyed our health care system because it put the priorities of shareholders ahead of that of patients. And we're living with the results. And at the same time, we're living with the results The people we look to to find answers to these challenges remain committed to the for-profit system as the only way to go. If you're going to take care of sick people in this world, you can't let what you do and how you do it be driven by ideology. It has to be driven by service to citizens. It has to be driven by the, by the Eagle Scout Oath. It has to be driven by our commitment and desire to do for our neighbors as they would do for us. Somehow, we got to restore that in our healthcare system. Otherwise, I don't see an answer to it. I would suggest to you that that's a pretty, pretty disturbing story. But it's a, it's a true one and a real one. And it's one that I wanted to share with you. And I made the decision during the break that we ought to begin with that issue in our second hour. Because since we're not going to do a program next week live, I wanted to make sure that got that that particular issue in while we were still able to broadcast it. We have less than 10 minutes left in our program today. We don't have enough time to get into much. 
But there's one issue that's going on right now that I did want to make a comment on because it's so important, I think. And there's so much happening in so many different areas that by definition, things naturally fall through the cracks. They're bound to. And I didn't want this one to fall through the cracks. Right now, that hasn't happened because it's front page stuff. But like other front page stuff, it's going to be replaced by new front page stuff. And when that happens, this is going to be gone into the background. The only thing I don't believe is that I don't believe it's going to totally slip into the background and become non-news because of the investigations of Robert Mueller, the special counsel. Given the charge that he was given by the, by the Department of Justice in this investigation, he can't afford to let this one go. I trust that he won't. But the rest of us might. And that's why I just wanted to make reference to it in the few minutes that we have left in today's program. What I'm talking about is this infamous June meeting that happened last year between the Russian attorney and Donald Trump Jr. on June 16th of 2016. The meeting that's been talked about off and on now for several weeks. The meeting that for a long time was about nothing more than adoption. The fact that Russian children used to be available for American adoption, but in retaliation for some of the restrictions and some of the issues, some of the, the, the moves that we have made to slap restrictions on Russia's behavior, Russia retaliated by stopping the availability of children for adoption. And theoretically, that's what this movement was, that meeting was about. And the reason we know that is because Donald Trump Jr. Donald Trump Jr. put out a memo in which he explained that that's what the meeting was about. It wasn't about Russia. It wasn't about the election. It wasn't about collusion. It was primarily about adoption. Turns out, after the fact, we learned that not only was Donald Trump there, but, Eric, but his brother-in-law, Eric Kushner, was there. And the campaign chair of the Trump campaign, Paul Manafort, was there. And for better than a week, that received the attention of commentators and pundits. And then we learned that that wasn't all that was in the room at the time. There was a translator, and there was now we find there was a Russian lobbyist there. Also, what we find is that the reason all of these people were there at the meeting was not really about Russian abortion, or the, abortion or the adoption rather of Russian children, but that the Russian lawyer had promised access to information that was negative about Hillary Clinton, information that would be very useful to Donald Trump in his presidential campaign against Hillary Clinton. And then the response was, once that debate started, the response was, well, that may have been there. That may be why, you know, what we thought was in the meeting. But when we got there, we found out that they really didn't have anything that was really that important. And then over the last few days, we've learned that this memo from Donald Trump Jr. was really written by President Trump himself. The Washington Post broke story at the end of last week that President Trump dictated the memo under the name of his son for distribution. And that's where the story about the fact that it was only about Russian adoption, that's where it came from. That's what the president said 
in the mem in the memo he dictated. His at President Trump's attorneys and members of the administration began to challenge that interpretation. And what I saw before we came on the air today was that President Trump himself had acknowledged that he contributed to the memo. He helped write it. He helped shape it, whether in fact he dictated the whole thing or not. Why is this important? It's important because it falls pretty neatly into the category, I'm not an attorney, but falls pretty neatly into the category of obstruction of justice. Whether in fact the meeting produced results or not, the purpose of it was to get dirt on Hillary Clinton for political reasons, not to discuss the adoption of Russian children. The fact that the memo said that the meeting was about children and had nothing to do about the, with the election or Hillary Clinton or anything else was because that's what President Trump put in it. Which meant that he participated clearly in an action which was designed to divert attention from the political realities of the campaign. It was a lie. The President of the United States participated in a lie in order to obstruct or block information related to the investigation of the Russian influence in our elections. And the President is openly acknowledging he did this. I'm not an attorney, but this seems to me to be as about, about as clear an indication of obstruction of justice as you can get. Many people believe the firing of Director Comey, FBI Director Comey, for purposes of stopping the Russia investigation because he wouldn't do it or pledges loyalty to the president. Many people believe that meeting was obstruction of justice. For a long time, people were hanging on the president's words that maybe there was tape of that particular conversation between Comey and President Trump. And then days and days after the event, President Trump admitted that there was no tape. At least he didn't have one. Now this. I would suggest to you that the principal roadblock in this whole thing, it seems to me, besides the time it is taking Robert Mueller to collect the evidence and interview participants, which is understandable in order to do research and collect the data on this kind of stuff. The other roadblock is in the Congress of the United States, in the behavior or lack of behavior of the Republican leadership to acknowledge the reality of what's going on. We have one minute before the end of our time. In absolutely no question in the world, not one second, do I doubt that this is a constitutional crisis we find ourselves in. And what makes it worse is that I'm not seeing any immediate solution to address it. With that, I need to say goodbye and I need to remind you that we won't be on next week. Our next broadcast will be a week from next Monday. Thank you so much for your continued support of Bob and Agnes and the folks at Head On, and for this particular program, the Virtual Center. I hope you have a wonderful day, a wonderful week. 
Thank you so very, very much. Please love each other. Be kind to each other.